During this segment, we'll meet Marisa and Chris, two attorneys who've taken on the case of Fatima Toure, a teenager from Guinea. Marisa and Chris will meet for the first time to discuss their goals and plan for the representation of Fatima. While you're viewing this segment, pay special attention to the way the lawyers consider the human factors involved in representing an asylum seeker, such as building trust and rapport with a client, and overcoming the emotional barriers that might inhibit a client from talking about the events that caused her to flee persecution. Hi, sorry I'm late. Hi. Oh, not Chris at all. Nugent, Public Law Client Meeting went over. You know how those oh, things are. Oh, that's okay. I'm Marisa Chancharulo from 10 the minutes late. Tax <laughs> Department. That's okay. I was reviewing the memo on this case. Oh well, good. You're you're definitely <laughs> ahead of me. I've barely looked at it. The client is a 16-year-old female from Guinea. Uh huh. And the only other facts I know about her are, are that she su she fled because she was in prison several times because of her father's political activity. And I think we're going to need to have a number of interviews with her. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to definitely take time. But, you know, you want to fight these cases as if your life was on the line and, uh, you know, and to win them, so whatever it takes. Um, so when do you, what do you think we need to do? Well, I think why don't we start by, you know, thinking about what our goals for this interview are going to be. And I, I think, you know, our, one of our goals, of course, is going to be to establish a rapport with this client. Yeah, yeah. We want the client to trust and respect us and be confident in us because that's how you get candor. A lot of times Absolutely. folks from other countries, I think, you know, don't trust attorneys because they think, they're like attorneys in their country, part of a corrupt legal system and authority figure. So. And credibility is such a huge aspect of these cases. So we need to know the whole story. And in order to, to do that, we're going to have to be very comfortable. She's going to have to be very comfortable with us. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, we'll probably want to ask some neutral questions to begin with of her, you know, so that she feels comfortable. You know, yeah. as opposed to cutting to the chase about what the case is about, you know, we can ask her, you know, we can ask her, you know, what she, what's her favorite course of study in school, That's her favorite foods, how the United States is different from Guinea. How she likes it here. Yeah, yeah, those types of things I think could be helpful. And then, you know, we can segue into, segue into, you know, more probing questions about right. her case. Because, of course, another major goal we're going to have for this interview is eliciting some of her story. Um, yeah. Naturally, we're not going to get all of it in the first interview. As we said before, we're going to need several interviews. Um, but we are going to have to start to get some of the story from her because yeah. we only get, you know, basic fact pattern from the referring agency. Well, and, you know, I, I, my goal in this, too, is to really outline what the law is for the client so they understand what we're up against. And I think, it, you know, the law is kind of complicated um, to, to explain, especially for a 16-year-old to understand. But that actually brings me to something else we should talk about, I think, and, and that's what her goals are for this interview. Do you think she'll want to know about these elements or that we have a duty to explain this to her? I think, I think it's good to explain what the asylum process is and what the elements are, um, you know, from the outset so they understand how their lives can fit into mm -hmm. the law. Mm -hmm. I just think, you know, given, given her age and what she might have gone through, we've got to be sensitive and really yeah. non-judgmental and work on developing the trust and try not to scare her with this process because it's, it's a lot of work. Absolutely. And I think that is also going to be one of her goals, just to have someone listen to her and empathize with her. Yeah, yeah, because who knows if she's been able to tell this to anyone else. Right. Yeah. Um, and certainly the immigration officials who she dealt with upon entering the United States were not sympathetic or, you know, someone who she could really trust. Yeah, and who knows what story she gave them, and that could pose some problems if yeah. she gave them a different story than what we're going to get. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think another thing she'll want to do from this first interview is determine whether she's comfortable with us as her attorney. Well, that's true. I mean, you know, she's the client. She's the one who's going to direct us. We just bring our expertise to the process. But we want her to know that she is front and center, right. um, uh, you know, for us. Well, maybe we should talk about, um, you know, the, some of the things we should do before meeting with her. Yeah, I guess, um, I guess we have some work ahead of us. Yeah. Um, let's see. 
some preliminary research, I think. I could have my um, paralegal pull some country reports. The uh, Department of State um, has a human rights report on every country, and we can have... Um, we also used Amnesty International and Human Rights Human Watch. Rights Watch. And also the UN Commission on, on Refugees. You know, and in that regard, we'll probably also want to just start finding a country expert, mm -hmm. you know, on human rights conditions, and because those, be reports, those reports are great, but they're not focused on your client. That's right. So if we find a country expert, they would be able to focus more on our client's circumstances. Um, so before the next meeting, I think we could at least get the, um, you know, the reports pulled and read them so that we can show her mm -hmm. that we're interested in, in, what, in her country and in what happened to her and that we did some homework. I, yeah, I think that would be great. But I'll also get my paralegal to start reaching out to, like, the universities and seeing who's who, who knows anything about Guinea, who could mm -hmm. be a good country expert that we could think about for court, who, mm -hmm. because that can help, help with the client's credibility and co really corroborate their story. Um, you know, we used a university professor the last time, as well as a journalist um, in our South American case, and that really sealed the deal. Oh, great. You know, I'm thinking for this case, we're also going to need a mental health expert. Why? Well, she's, I, only, she's only 16. Yeah, but I have a feeling that if she was arrested um, a number of times in her country, that she could have suffered some severe trauma things she might not even be able to tell us, even if she develops a good relationship with us, that a psychologist would be better able to bring out. There are, um, you know, a number of people who, of mental health experts who do this pro bono or for a small fee, um, and there are organizations who can actually help you find a mental health expert. We used one in my old okay, case. Okay, well, really I'll leave helpful. that to you. I mean, my okay, South no American problem. didn't need it, but this client, you know, might need she it. She might need it, yeah. I think it, it would be a good idea. Yeah. Um, we can ask her, why did you flee Guinea? She might say, because they harmed me. And we can ask her, what happened? You know, just keep it really broad and open-ended and see how much she's willing to tell us in that first interview. Yeah, but at first, I, you know, I, I said before, I, I think we should start with just like neutral background questions, oh, yeah. you know, like what's your favorite food? You know, if you, I don't have a kid, so, and I, I, I'm not a big brother um, yeah. either, so I haven't worked with kids, but I think, no, you know. No, I think that's a really good idea. I mean, I even like to do that with my adult clients, just a little bit of small talk in the beginning, so I think maybe we'll just have to do that for a little longer time with her. You know, yeah, you know, there probably are stuff. some law reviews out there, you know, on working with kids and Im immigration matters that That's a great I'll idea. get my paralegal to, you know, research that because I, I don't know the first thing about Neither approaching a child. What do you think about having an interpreter? Um, but she's, is she in school here? I think so. What language does she speak? French. French. Okay, I don't speak French. So. Neither do I. Okay, so it's going to take longer with an interpreter. Yeah, but I think it's very important to have one so that we can get all the details. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she may speak some English, but she may not be able to articulate the things that we're going to need to talk to her about. Yeah, well, you know, the last time around we got an interpreter from the University Foreign Language Program. Oh, that's a good um, idea. So I can, uh, I can have my paralegal reach out to them. I'm, I'm pretty sure also this pro bono group that referred the case mm -hmm. would know of some good interpreters who would volunteer or interpret, you know, for a uh, you know, reasonable fee. Um, now that I remember, my Congolese case, we used um, an attorney here at the firm who really? spoke French. Yeah, my client was a French speaker. Oh, mm -hmm. well then... I'll send out an email. That, that would be good, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah. it would be great if we could get more people in the firm involved because yeah. these cases, you know, tend to really inspire people. And it might be okay even to have more than one interpreter. You mm -hmm. know, he's, we'll see how it works out because schedules conflict and also in court, um, she's going to have a court-appointed in interpreter, not someone of her own choosing. We can't bring this interpreter. No. Okay. No. So it might be good to get her used to a couple different people, if she even needs one. We'll yeah. see how it goes that yeah. first time. Surrounding me are statues of the founding fathers of the United States of America. Many of their ancestors fled to this country because they feared persecution in their home lands. For example, Benjamin Franklin's father was a Puritan, and he, he fled with others to New England who had been suffering persecution because of their religion. In addition, David Carroll's family, 
fled to the country because they had been persecuted because of their Catholic faith. His family moved to Maryland, which at the time was very well known as a haven for religious tolerance. In addition, many of the other Constitution signers were Quakers who had fled to this country because they feared persecution. For example, John Dickinson's family came to Virginia in the 17th century, and his family was persecuted because they were Quaker. Today, Marisa and Chris will hear a more modern version of these experiences when they interview their client, Fatima Touré, for the first time. Fatima has recently fled from Guinea. Her family is related to a prominent political opposition leader, and the opposition leader is being sought after by the Conte government. Because he's in hiding, the Conte government has come after his family, trying to get them to tell the whereabouts of the political opponent or to force him out of hiding. So as a result, Fatima and her family have been persecuted. Today, during this first interview with their client, Marisa and Chris will focus on developing trust and rapport with their client. As you're viewing this, pay attention also to the way that the lawyers handle the situation when they think that their client is a little concerned about talking about the events of her persecution in front of a male attorney. It's also interesting to look at their two law different lawyering styles and consider which is more appropriate in this setting. My name is Marisa Chancherulo. And I'm Chris Nugent. Are you hungry? We have, we have a little snack here if you're interested. No, teacher. No? You had lunch today? Yes. Hi, Lisa. How Hello. are you? It's nice Hi. to see you. Tim. Thank you so much for coming today. Sure. Fatima, are we saying your name right? Fatima? Yes. Touré. Fatima Touré. Yes. Great. So how are you doing? How do you like school? It is a bit difficult for me because mm. I don't understand the, a lot of what they say. But your English is very good. Did you learn English at home? Yes. That's wonderful. Well, what's your favorite topic in, in, in school? History. History. That was mine, too, when I was in high school. That's great. So have you made friends at school? Not many. Not many. Yeah, it's hard at first. What, what grade are you in? I'm in 10th grade. 10th grade. It takes a little time, but are there other, other children from Africa in school? Lisa, we're really happy you're here, and I just wanted to clarify a little bit about your role as an interpreter okay. in, the, in, the, in this matter. Um, you know, Fatima is going to be our client in an mm -hmm. asylum case, and asylum cases tend to be pretty sensitive, and we have to keep all of her client's confidences um, within, to, you know, with us. And so you also need to keep all of the information that comes out in this interview confidential okay. um, and not share it with anyone else. Um, also, in terms of interpreting, uh, do you have any experience interpreting before? Yes, I've interpreted before. Mm -hmm. in, in immigration matters? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. In, in an asylum uh, matter? But not in an asylum matter. No. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, it's a little different. There are some different terms. Um, so just let us know if you have a problem translating anything. Yeah, there are some legal terms yeah. that you'll have to translate from immigration law. Okay. The other thing to bear in mind as an interpreter is we expect you to be like a telephone mm -hmm. where whatever she says goes to you and comes to us exactly as she said it and in the first person, you know, so that it's not like, oh, she said X. We want to hear it in her words because we need to get her story as accurately as possible in her words for purposes of preparing the asylum application. And when you don't understand something that she said, let us know that so that we can, you can redirect the question to the client. But we need to hear everything that is, that is being spoken. Um, 
We also, also, how, how much experience in French do you have? Well, I've been studying for seven years now. Okay. And um, I spent a year abroad in uh -huh. France. So. And would you say you're fluent? Yes, yes. Oh, good. Fatima, it, have you had a chance to talk to Lisa today in uh, French? I do talk a bit. Oh, great. And do you understand each other? Yes. Great. And there's not a problem with dialects between you two? No, it's fine. Oh, good. It's fine. Great. Good. Um, well, I have a question. Is it okay if I take notes? Um, if, you know, there's a period where she's speaking a lot in order for me to interpret it back to you. Oh, yeah, yeah. we encourage that. that. Okay. But we want you to leave the notes with us at the okay. end of the interview right. so that we have them. And why don't we explain that to Fatima now? Yeah, Fatima, we were just speaking with Lisa, your interpreter, and just explaining um, what she's going to do today and how she's going to help us. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, we, and just stop us if, if you don't understand something we're saying and Lisa will interpret for you, okay? Okay. Okay, we are lawyers here at the firm and we are going to represent you um, in your immigration case um, for free. You don't have to pay us. Um, and we're going to work together on the case. It's, it's very important that you understand that everything that we say in this room or on the telephone if we call you on the phone or you call us is completely confidential. Do you know what that means? Confidential? Mm. Okay. It doesn't leave this room or is not shared with the government unless you authorize us to. The judge in your case will want to hear about your country from someone who has studied it for a long time. Uh, we call a person like that an expert. And we will have to, um, you know, talk to the expert about you, but we'll ask your permission before we do that also. And we're going to ask you to help us. I mean, we're going to do a lot of work to help prove your case. We're going to find, you know, a lot of the, the documents, the reports. Um, we'll find the experts. Uh, what we're going to need your help with is knowing exactly what happened and also finding um, people, um, maybe people back home, who can write letters explaining what happened. So those are things, you know, we don't know who to contact. We would ask you how to get in contact with those people. So we'll actually be asking you to do a few things um, to help us, kind of like homework. Do you like homework? Sometimes. Sometimes. I, well, we hope you like this kind of homework. I mean, the asylum process isn't easy, Fatima. And we're here every step of the way with you and want to work closely with you. And we realize it's very hard for people, especially if they've, you know, had experienced uh, horrible things, to talk about them to us, as well as to talk about them to the judge. So let me just start with um, a few questions for you, Fatima. Why did you come here to the United States? Because my life was being threatened in Guinea, and I feared that they would continue to harm and beat me. Why was your life threatened? Because my family is involved in politics mm -hmm. in Guinea, and my father is working to change the government, mm -hmm. and they see him and all of us as a threat. I see. Now, you said that they beat you? Yes. Who are you talking about? Um, so, how do you say Um, soldiers. So, government, soldier. Mm. And what, did they do anything else? They tortured was it just you or was it with your family or others? It was my mother, my aunt, and my cousin, Kumar. 
Is that a girl cousin? It's a boy. Kumar? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Did this happen many times or a few times? Many times. When did this happen to you? Um, about two years ago. Um, do you remember what month? Um, I think it was... I realize it can be difficult to remember months and years, but we want to just try to get a sense of when it happened, and we'll, we've got time to really pinpoint it. Right. In January? Okay. Two years ago. Okay. Now, you said that they tortured you. Um, what did you mean by that? One time they, when they had me and my cousin, mm -hmm. they took us outside. Actually, um, Chris, didn't you have a phone call you needed to make? Chris will be right back. He hey, needs I, to I make have to a make a phone, phone call, call, but I'll, I'll be right back. I'm sorry, Fatima, you were saying? That they, they took us outside mm -hmm. and it was very hot mm -hmm. and they put, made us um, on the Versailles sur des pierres. Um, they, uh, we had to um, get on our knees on, on the rocks, mm -hmm. on the ground. Et elles étaient très chaudes et pointues. And the rocks were very um, hot and pointed, mm -hmm. sharp. And they left us there for hours. Mm. Did the soldiers ever do anything else to you? Um. Uh, they raped me. I'm so sorry to hear that. Can you talk about that at all today? Can you maybe tell me when that happened? I'll get you a tissue. Maybe you can tell me when, how long ago that was? Um, when they took me from school with mm -hmm. my friend, mm -hmm. Fatumata. Mm -hmm. um, one of the soldiers came in and I'm sorry, it's very That's difficult. Okay. That's okay, so you can take your time. And I'm sorry that we have to talk about it at all. But it is, um, so it's, it's really important for the judge to know. So thank you for telling me. Um, it was <coughs> many of them, mm -hmm. and they took turns. Violating Fatumata and me. Mm. How old were you? I was 15. So this wasn't too long ago? No. Okay. Um, is it okay if Chris comes back in now? Yes. Okay. Come on in. Do you know why the soldiers attacked you? I think that one of the problems is that in Guinea, if you're involved against the government politically, that you can become very easily a target. Fatima is going to have to tell her story, so mm -hmm. we might as well also hear it from her and make, see if she knows. Fatima, do you know why the government soldiers um, attacked you and your family? Or do you, do you have a... Do you sense why? You don't have to know completely why, but 
Why would they do something like that? Mm -hmm. I think that um, first because of my family's involvement in the government, in politics, mm -hmm. because my father was a leader of the um, main opposition party mm. to President Conte, and um, because of my, I am Malenke. Mm -hmm. what, what's Malenke? It is my tribe, uh -huh. and they do not like us. So, why does the government not like the Malankis? They just don't. It's they are a different tribe, and they do not want us to be. They are afraid that we will um, take power of the government. Mm -hmm. So the government has a different tribe. And the government, the people in the government are of a different tribe? Yes. And which tribe is that? Susu. Susu. Mm. Do they speak a different language? Yes, they have their own language. Okay. And how, how would the government know that you're Malanke? They just know because I look Malanke. Okay. And my name, Touré, mm -hmm. is a Malanke name. Oh, I see. So that's interesting. Yeah. You might want to try to reach out to an anthropologist to understand it better. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions that you want to ask Fatima today? Um, in terms of the political reasons that you think the government didn't like you and your family, um, did you also participate in politics, or was it just your dad, your your father? Um, I did attend some meetings mm -hmm. with my friend from school, and we would discuss the political situation in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And you did this at age 16, 15, 16? Yes. Okay. And, and why did you think things were wrong? Because... The president, his regime is wrong. Mm -hmm. He treats, he violates um, um, human rights, mm. and he controls the media. And he has um, um, selection illegitimate. Um, he was um, uh, um, illegally elected. He's not, he's not legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, when well, you that's, that's very, very helpful, Fatima, because, you know, we have to show why the government sought to harm you, and it sounds like you had very strong political beliefs, convictions, opinions, and activities, mm -hmm. and that's a very good reason to get asylum. And the reason why we have to ask you these difficult questions and ask you to talk about terrible things that happened is because the judge needs to believe you and a lot of people you know say that things happen to them but they didn't really happen but if the judge hears you testify and talk about difficult things then um, he or she will be more likely to believe uh, that, it, that it really happened so that's why we have to ask you to talk about these things even though I know you don't want to talk about them. You said you were telling me about how they made you kneel on the rocks in the sun and that they beat you um, other times. Do you have any scars or physical? Yes, on yeah. my knees. On your knees. And I have a scar on my hand because they tried to hit me oh. on my head and I cover, tried to cover my head. And what happened and it, to your And finger? it cut. My finger. Oh, I see. Okay. Let's talk about a little bit of homework. We need some help from you. Okay, so um, one of the things is that we are going to need to hear from people back home who can kind of, you know,
prove that they can say that what happened to you really happened to you. So it's not only you that's saying it's happened, but someone else is saying it happened too, and that makes it easier for the judge to believe. In fact, that would be something you could help us do, is give us names and addresses and phone numbers of people and tell us how they know you so that we know what to ask them. Now, this was your father who was involved with politics, right? Yes. Okay. Can you um, get us proof that he was involved with a certain, was he in a political party? Yes. Yes. What was the name it's of the party? Called the UF. R. UFR, okay. Union of Republican Forces. Union of Republican Forces, okay. Um, can you get proof that your father was um, a member of this group? What kind? Well, like, a, like sometimes I think in other countries you have a membership card when you belong to a political party. Maybe a okay. card. Or, or a, letter, a letter, a letter from somebody with okay. the political party. Okay. Were you involved in this political party? You mentioned that at school you went to meetings, right? Yes. Is do you have a membership card? Um, I'm not really um, involved a lot. Okay. I just went to a few meetings. So you weren't an official member. No, no card. But okay. did some people see you go to the meetings, like friends or family? Yes, I okay. went with some friends. Well, good. Maybe if you're comfortable, one of your friends could write a letter um, telling us that you went to this meeting. Okay. 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 What um, other... Uh, and I guess we just... Uh, if you could start that as soon as possible, that would be great because it, it takes a long time for us to get documents from, from Guinea. So. The next time we meet, if you can bring us some names and addresses. The, okay. that the would other be great. thing that I'm writing all down, the, the homework here, so that it'll be easier to follow. The other thing we're going to need is a chronology of your experiences. Do you understand chronology? Mm -hmm. uh, C'est une chronologie de, des événements. A timeline? Do you understand a timeline? Yes. So what will help is if you could, you know, specify when the problems began, step by step by step, and then for, you know, and have all the experiences with the date and the place and what happened. It doesn't have to be long. No. It can be short, but it would be your story and your words, but from when it began till when you came to the United States. Is that, is that? I don't. I don't want to think about it anymore. Um. Yeah, I understand. I know. It's, it's very, very difficult. And I, I wish it were easier to get asylum. You know, you could just tell us they, what happened and we'd tell the judge and that would be it. But unfortunately... They don't make it that easy. Yeah, it's really, really hard and, and you have a big job to do. Okay, we have some forms here that we need you to sign, okay? Um, this form allows us to get a copy of your... Um, Immigration in, file. Right. Well, let's sign the notice of entry of appearance. This is a form, this green form, tells the judge that we are your lawyer. Um, so you can sign that, and that way we can send all the documents to the judge. And we and can go with you to court. Go to we'll be going right. to every court with you. Thank you. And we also have another form that you have to sign. This is a notice of entry of appearance. It's as like the one you just signed. But this but is for the Immigration Service, uh, for the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so that we can, you know, so that we can represent you before them. And we'll use this to get the um, information also from your, from the immigration department about what happened at the airport. You know, I don't seem to have it with me. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. Right we also have, we said we're representing you for free, and we have what's called... 
a retainer agreement. That means an agreement between you as the client and us as the attorneys of the work that we're going to do. Um, so we'll leave this with, um, with, with the interpreter and she can read it to you in, in French and you can sign it and uh, we'll have a copy sent to you. One other thing we're going to work on is having health experts. Um, we're going to ask you to see a doctor to, um, so the doctor can explain different physical things that happen to you. And then we'll also ask you, and we'll talk about this some more, but we'd like to see you, uh, like to have you see a psychologist. Why do I need? Well, you don't, but it, the psychologist can help you um, better explain your story. A lot of times people who've gone through really difficult experiences, you know, people that I, we've known, clients, um, you know, sometimes they can't sleep well at night, mm -hmm. they don't have any appetite, they might be afraid to make new friends, um, you know, they might sweat at night. Um, there are lots of reactions which are natural that happen to people when bad things happen to them. Right. And a psychologist could be helpful to prove to the judge that these things happened um, as well as show that what happened to you really caused a lot of harm. Would you be willing to do that if we found someone? Yes. It, again, it's all confidential too between you and the psychologist, but you can let the psychologist then tell us what was said and we could help present it to the court. But, you know, that's a confidential relationship too. Yeah. And if you like, I can try to make sure that the medical people are women, if you would prefer that. Yeah? Yes. Okay, well then I'll do my best to, to arrange that. Do you have um, any questions for us before we finish today? Um, I feel okay. I'm happy to be here. Good. Um, I miss my mother.